Okay. Welcome to our final session for the day, which I think is going to be a fantastic conversation. Joining us, we have Delilah Barrios, who ran for governor of Texas this year, who describes herself as a working class woman of color fighting for environmental justice. She states, no matter where I live or ever plan to live, the fight for sustainability and environmental justice will remain. I aim to be on the side of humanity and reason to protect what natural habitats we have left always on the side of the oppressed, never the oppressor. Also, we have Robert Blake. He's the owner of Solar Bear, a solar installation company located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Also, Robert is the executive director of Native Sun Community Power Development, which is a nonprofit also located in Minneapolis. Robert is a tribal citizen of the Red Lake Nation. His passion is spreading the word about renewable energy through communication, cooperation, and collaboration. Last on our panel is Puvan Moodley. He is a human rights lawyer and social justice activist from South Africa. Before joining Natural Justice, he was the Associate Country Director of Oxfam GB in South Africa and the Global Head of Campaigning for Action Aid International. He most recently led with other activists the successful campaign for a just energy future to stop South Africa's proposed massive nuclear deal with the Russians against all odds. He has contributed to a range of struggles across the globe, starting with the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa when he was 14. He has worked extensively in over 20 countries and has campaigned from local to global levels with a range of communities and activists, including on issues such as women's right to land in Africa, challenging large mining companies that are destroying indigenous communities and the environment, people's right to health and education, repression by governments and climate change. He's worked for and with a range of international organizations and movements. He continues to provide solidarity and support to activists across the globe. Our moderator is Tammy Murphy. She's the Advocacy Director for PSR Pennsylvania with graduate degrees in international peace and conflict resolution and dispute resolution diplomacy. Tammy has worked as an educator, a special health projects assistant, executive director, medical outreach coordinator, and a consultant. Above all else, she's passionate about justice and the intersection of law and social movements. With that, I'll pass it over to Tammy. Okay, hi, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you all 46 of you for sticking around in this afternoon. It's been a great conference so far. And this is such an honor to have such a wonderful panel to speak to. So thank you so much um, to my panelists for being here. Just to let you know the layout, I would like to ask each of you sort of round of questions. I'll go around to each of you and ask one question, then I'll ask another question, and then I'm gonna throw out a third question that I would like you to just sort of discuss. Um, so uh, let's go traditional here and start with uh, ladies first. We're gonna start with uh, Delilah. Hello. Hi, Delilah. <laughs> um, so thank you for joining us. Um, so my first question is if you would, um, if you would please briefly introduce yourself and tell us about what inspired you on your path. Um, I am specifically interested to um, also hear about um, how the book, The Red New Deal, um, Indigenous Action to Save the Earth has inspired you and what it means to you. Sure. Um, so yeah, just again, I, I, uh, I did run for office in Texas on the Green Party ticket, but my uh, most of my experience um, in this field comes from being an advocate and an activist. And so um, I've been involved in a lot of protests and demonstrations against pipelines in this region and uh, the struggle is ongoing. So for me, um, when the Red Deal came out, um, I am indigenous, but I come from South Texas and it's hard for indigenous people. We didn't have rights to participate in ceremony until 1975. 
So, you know, I'm still on the reclaiming, reconnecting journey myself. And so luckily I have a lot of traditional uh, family members that taught me things that I need to know to be a good steward of the land and to be a good person. Um, so, you know, for me, reading a book like The Red Deal is a great introduction for people who want to be on the revolutionary path, people who want to uh, take matters into their own hands and uh, and work towards liberation for all and, and face one of our hugest, most uh, pressing crises right now, which is protecting our planet. So that's uh, that's what the Red Deal uh, means to me, and it inspires me to never stop um, being an activist and organizer because the the fight never ends. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. I ordered the book and have not read it yet, um, but I've been reading about it because I was really excited when I saw it on your website. So thanks for introducing it to me, and hopefully um, we can get someone to put a link up. The title of the book again is. The, if, make sure I'm getting this correctly, the Red New Deal, Indigenous Action to Save Our Earth. Um, um, yeah, it's actually just the Red Deal. The Red Deal, okay. By the Red Nation. Mm -hmm. Okay, by the Red Nation. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, next we're gonna move on to Robert Blake. And um, similarly, can you also introduce yourself and let us know what inspired you on your current path? Yeah, Ani Buju, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Blake. I am a, a tribal citizen of the Red Lake Nation. Uh, owner of Solar Bear, a solar installation company located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm also uh, the executive director of Native Sun Community Power Development and serve on various boards and um, uh, organizations across the country, state, locally. Um, and um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, part of, I guess, uh, one of the things that, um, I don't know, listening um, to, the, to the last speaker, um, I, one of the things that just reminded me of is we're building an electric vehicle charging network. Um, in direct uh, opposition to the uh, Line 3 pipeline that was uh, up here in the state of Minnesota and um, the Dakota Access Pipeline. So uh, we have this uh, electric vehicle charging network um, uh, running through the Red Lake Nation over to Standing Rock and then back to uh, the Twin Cities. And the whole idea there was to be in direct opposition to the fossil fuel industry and to tell them that we're still resisting and that we are going to give people the opportunity to make a choice um, between electric vehicles and, uh, of course, uh, uh, continuing to use fossil fuels. So um, as part of the work that I do, uh, creating, uh, creating up um, uh, tribal utilities, creating um, uh, renewable energy projects, and uh, doing workforce development and uh, education programs. So uh, it's all a part of my work, and um, I love just uh, being having the opportunity to be here and, and amongst all of you. Uh, miigwech, everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That was a nice, quick introduction. We're going to get into some more details in the next round. Um, next, I would like to ask you, Proven, um, thank you for staying up so late. I realize you're like seven hours ahead of us. Um, so thank you. And um, so my question for you is, would you please briefly introduce yourself and with a history of working at the crossroads of the anti-apartheid movement and climate justice, can you please talk about what inspired you on your path? Yeah, thank you so much. And it's really good opportunity to be here and to engage. Um, yeah, I, you know, grew up in apartheid South Africa. I think, uh, you know, one of the key things from very early on is is understanding the injustice because you know you were not allowed to do many things, and uh, the restrictions, the violence, um, you know, was was massive back then. Um, and, you know, linked to that was also in terms of the environmental issues is that, you know, in many places, uh, black people were placed in areas next to coal fired uh, power stations or other factories, etc, which, you know, cause an was, you know, an of, of apartheid but also the uh, injustice in terms of um, the, the environment as well. Uh, and, and that, you know, started a movement and, you know, very much got involved in the youth movement in South Africa back then, uh, but also started seeing the same injustices in other indigenous and local communities across Africa, but also across the globe, you know, wherever I went, whether it was in the Northern Territories in Australia, where, Glencore was killing the land, killing the uh, rivers, killing, uh, you know, ecosystems. Um, 
to more recently, you know, uh, oil and gas projects and other mining projects. So, you know, that's kind of what uh, kept me going uh, to, to really fight for justice because, uh, you know, colonization, um, slavery is not a thing of the past. Uh, all of that is still going on. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go into my second round of questions. Um, Delilah, um, I wanted to talk to you about this. This is something that um, we spoke briefly about when we were on the phone. Um, in Pennsylvania, um, indigenous tribes are not recognized. Um, so um, obviously that, that really poses some very serious issues for, um, for families here in Pennsylvania. Um, I know that there um, that you mentioned some similar struggles in in Texas about um, having the government recognize and um, even harder to get them to respect um, tribal sovereignty. So if you could talk about that and also, um, yeah, so I guess with that, like, so what are the problems and if there are any um, solutions that you have found? Um, you know, obviously, as our last panelist mentioned, colonialism, racism is ongoing. So mm -hmm. a lot of the tribes are seeking, um, you know, the, uh, that, tr that tribal um, recognition. Uh, we've got the uh, Karankawa Kadla clan or tribe that's down here, and they are leading the fight against um, LNG and um, you know, the uh, the export terminals that they're proposing are on top of indigenous artifacts, and ancestral artifacts. And so they're, they're, you know, they're holding a lot of demonstrations and they're rallying the community around stopping these, these expansions and these pipeline projects. Mm -hmm. um, what we can do is continue to support indigenous led resistance and, um, you know, it's not easy because a lot of the funding, if you are not, you know, on a profit or you're not in some profit motivated um, form of organization, it's very difficult because of the legal battles, because of, you know, getting people to and from where they need to go. So donating to these causes does help. Um, there's a group that I try to help out as much as possible. Um, the tribal, oh my God, I'm gonna mess it up. It's uh, the Gulf Coast, uh, there's a, why am I so bad right now? I'm sorry, there's a, I'll add it all in a second, um, but there's like three different tribes active in Texas that I know of that are that are leading the resistance against um, the, the expansion of oil and gas in the state. Texas, this region has been overexploited and if you look at a map of our state, if you look at a map, a map of the entire country, you'll see there's just pipeline after pipeline after pipeline. And at this point with the threat of, you know, sustainable energy, what the pipeline companies are doing is they're, they're expanding with complete neglect for any future concerns. Like they already have active, active lines and um, it's not enough, they wanna, extract as much resource as they possibly can. So in fact, the fight is getting harder because they know that consumers want sustainable options. So um, yeah, I mean, every day there, there are people organizing. And um, I think uh, one of the most important things that, you, that we need to do is uh, continue to uplift and um, support the communities who are showing up every day, who are going to court, like I was a single mom at the time and I had to bring my kids to a court hearing, um, an injunction hearing about the Kinder Morgan pipeline coming through the Texas Hill Country where I live now. And I mean, there was a good amount of support against this pipeline expansion and it threatened endangered species, it threatened springs and the public was very clear that they did not want this project and it got pushed through anyway. So the the real thing we need to understand is that the the power is with the people you don't have to be wealthy you don't have to be a politician in order to support these movements you just have to show up great um so some of the um, groups that you're thinking of if you can um at some point make sure that we have it so we can share it with people as a follow-up um or maybe um, if you 
Um, I know that Becca put in the in the comment. Um, I think it was the Permian Gulf Coast Coalition. I don't know if that was one of the groups that you're thinking of. Um, I will add it. <laughs> Let um, me so, get it for you. Yeah, so I appreciate that very much. Um, as PK noted in our comments, like we are uh, in Pennsylvania um, with indigenous people not recognized, um, it's, it's really, you know, it's very difficult to get any kind of injustice. Like I'm thinking of the, like UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, those kinds of things, not only they're not generally respected in the United States, but when it comes down to a state like Pennsylvania, it's literally like they have their blinders on as if there's just, you know, no color. We don't see um, indigenous people as anything, you know, like not even identified. So it's, it's incredibly hard. Um, so Delilah, I appreciate the work that you do. And I know that it's not easy um, to, to keep pushing through those barriers. Um, we're gonna move on to Robert right now. Thanks for sharing that Delilah. Um, we're gonna move on to Robert right now because Robert, you are doing some really amazing stuff um, with the public utilities and um, you have plans where you are. Um, so if you can talk about where, what you're doing locally and how you plan to expand that um, to, to benefit all indigenous people and, and ultimately to, to benefit all of us because it does so much to impact climate. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, House File 1647 um, in, uh, in the state of Minnesota. Um, this is a, a, a piece of legislation that I've been working on to get passed. Uh, for the last four years uh, with the help of the Department of Commerce. And what it basically does is it creates a tribal energy advisory board. So uh, it's House File 1647, um, Tribal Energy Advisory Board. And what this board is basically gonna do is it's gonna be the seedlings for a public, a tribal utilities commission um, that will act in conjunction with the Public Utilities Commission. So when there's energy infrastructure being built um, this will be able to, the tribal nations um, will be able to have a say um, about that energy infrastructure uh, being built. And so basically have a seat at the table and that's huge. And um, uh, I've gotten bipartisan support on this legislation and um, it's ready to pass uh, this next go around. Um, now, um, I didn't expect Minnesota to have a blue governor a blue Senate and a blue house. <laughs> we have the trifecta here in the state of Minnesota. So uh, I guess that maybe this work was all for nothing now, <laughs> but um, but uh, I, I thought I was gonna have to continue to deal with the opposite uh, 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 Republicans basically to, to deal with on this piece of legislation. But incidentally, I got their support on this too. So, um, so this is really gonna be important and um, I hope to uh, then um, actually bring this across the country uh, to other states, have find other allies um, that will uh, help support this and bring it to um, the state, their state legislations. Um, also on a federal level, um, I've been, you know, working uh, with federal officials, um, uh, FERC um, and, and, and other ones to um, basically uh, look at how our transmission and our um, interconnection processes um, are gonna be handled for tribal nations. So these are really important aspects because uh, uh, we know that the utilities in, in the fossil fuel industry are uh, embedded in our, um, in our uh, regulatory system. They have lobbyists, they have people to pay. Um, they're like dinosaurs and they're not gonna move for anybody. And uh, so I'm basically trying to leverage tribal sovereignty uh, to move these dinosaurs. Um, because if we don't decolonize the transportation system, if we don't decolonize the electricity grid, then uh, we are gonna continue to uh, commit equal suicide. Um, and we have to uh, stop this uh, genocide and, and stop this, uh, you know, this, the, this killing of our, of our people and in, in, in our planet. Um, and, and this is the way that I think that we do it so uh, I have a, a graduate degree in policy, um, and, um, and so uh, this is the way that um, I'm working on it. Um, and uh, very excited to announce that too, that when I started working with this law firm um, a couple of years ago to create a tribal utility for my tribal nation, the Red Lake Nation, 
Um, there was like only two or three of us that were working with them. Uh, now we have like close to 70, 70 tribal nations that are working to create their own tribal utilities. Um, and uh, because now we have the uh, we have the technology to create distributed energy resources, um, to create this power source, to create jobs, and employment, and economic development opportunities for these communities. Um, and uh, so I'm really excited at where this is going, and um, I really do believe that tribal nations can help lead the way. So, um, but I do need all of your help. I need all need all of your voices. Um, you know, and uh, you can uh, reach me through uh, Robert at nativesun.org, or just go to nativesun.org or reach me through solarbear.earth and, um, and, and, you know, and help support this, this effort. So, uh, yeah, that, that's how I would, that's, that's how I'm doing it in, Great. in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. So it, I wanted to say two things about that. One, it reminds me of uh, Commissioner e or, or, or Nico Brown, who was on earlier um, a panel, and she said that she felt like um, she could not get a seat at the table. So she just said, like, forget it. I'm going to build my own table and now everybody's coming to her for uh you know solutions to problems because she built her own table and it's better um so i love what you're doing and um the other thing i love about what you're doing is i feel like um it's the kind of thing like it's it's to scale like um on the size and in the speed of of that which we need to to really address this issue so i appreciate that a lot about your work and and, and tammy you know I, I just gotta say to everyone that a lot of these ideas came from me just all me just standing in here with you know um all of us brothers and sisters you know opposing line three or you know sitting there in the hot sun like there's got to be an easier way to do this yeah. <laughs> there's Can't just hold this sign forever. To do this. <laughs> and that's really where these ideas really came from so yeah. uh don't some don't don't uh, underestimate people like uh the last speaker said showing up and uh, participating mm -hmm. uh because uh there's going to be a lot of great ideas that come out of those conversations when you're uh when you're arm to arm with uh you know with everyone yeah when you're gathered they're holding the line there's lots of uh passion and power um so the other thing that inspired me from the phone call that we had um you you said that this this really all started about five years ago and um just on a personal level that gave me a lot of hope because i could see something you know greater ahead in five years for myself and uh you know doing good work and um we should all be inspired by that where we are right now is just the beginning yeah, and I just want to say to everybody too, two years ago, a little over two years ago, I started working with Baker Tilly Law Firm to create, you know, the, the framework for a tribal utility for my community. And now there's like 70, you know, mm -hmm. tribal nations in there where there was only a couple. And so, you know, you think about the IRA Act and now what this means to tribal country and the money that's flowing into tribal country. Um, and, you know, kudos to my Senator Tina Smith and Pete Wyckoff who have, who have pushed for incentives for tribal country to get involved in this energy process because i always say to tribal nations and i said this on um, you know uh, native america calling on the radio show that uh we're in the we're in the gaming business which is a billion dollar business we need to be in the energy game that's a trillion dollar business we are in the wrong game for people you know and so um i hope that you know all that resonates with native nations and and especially how we can lead in this transition and um, because we are the only people with the government inside this government and um, these uh, these utilities and these uh, fossil fuel corporations are embedded deeply. So, um, you know, we, we have a we have a responsibility to the planet and, and to our fellow man to, uh, to to move forward with this. So, yeah. I appreciate that so much. Um, it looks like we've got lots of comments in the question in the uh, chat. So um, there probably be a lot of questions at the end. Um, for a second question, I also want to ask Proven a second question. This is going to be um, pretty specific. Um, we'll kind of start specific and get a little broader. But um, given that we just watched Shell ignite their toxic ethane cracker plant in Western Pennsylvania after receiving an, obs an obscene amount of state tax subsidies, can you please speak to us about your legal wins with natural justice against the Shell Corporation? specifically and um specifically also with uh talking about the importance of free prior and informed consent yeah no absolutely uh you know i first heard about shell wanting to do oil and gas drilling along the south africa coastline when i was at the climate summit in glasgow and uh, the one before the one, uh, in, one just happened in egypt um and basically they were going to draw uh six thousand square kilometers which meant 
it would uh, be air guns blasting into the ocean uh, for six months uh, nonstop. Um, and, you know, we felt we had to stop this. So, you know, we've been working with local uh, communities along the East Coast, indigenous communities, and they've been living in a very traditional way, uh, you know, in terms of uh, small scale fishing, and they live off the ocean, small scale farming, ecotourism. Um, and, you know, they've been challenging uh, an Australian mining company for the last 10 years, and 10 activists were killed because they were, you know, trying to oppose this while our government was supporting the mining company. So we basically took Shell to court and, you know, we argued firstly that uh, communities were not consulted. Uh, you know, there were a few people that were paid off, you know, to do a tick box exercise. Uh, you know, the proper environmental impact assessments were not done. We argued that, you know, based on the state of the planet and climate change, uh, you know, they haven't taken that into consideration. But beyond all of those arguments, we also, for the first time, argued that you know communities, uh, especially indigenous communities, have got a cultural and spiritual connection to the land and the ocean, uh, and we argued that quite strongly. And uh, you know, to our surprise, the judges took that argument very seriously. It became one of the key points of the case. But ultimately, you know, we won the case. Uh, it was, you know, David versus Goliath battle because it's small communities, you know, battling against a multinational company. But it set a major precedent, uh, you know, not just for South Africa, but for, for, for other parts of, of Africa as well. The challenge, however, is that there's over 400 other oil and gas projects that are mapped just with Africa alone. Uh, but also, you know, in East Africa, we're challenging, it would be the longest heated oil pipeline that cuts across two countries and across indigenous communities, the Serengeti, you know, highly biodiverse areas. Uh, and this is the French company, Total, who's planning the longest heated oil pipeline. But it's all over the Okavango Delta, where the First Nations, uh, the sand people, uh, uh, you know, is another area where uh, Canadian uh, oil company, Recon Africa, has got permission to do oil and gas drilling, again, in a very biodiverse area, in an area where indigenous communities uh, are living. So, you know, these projects are, you know, uh, uh, across the continent. The key thing, uh, you know, is that A, communities are standing up, and I think that's the last line of defense. Uh, you know, the, these legal uh, challenges are long and expensive. Uh, but, you know, they do bring, like in this case, uh, major precedents that make it much more difficult for, you know, other companies because they can't just do what they want to do. They have to go and follow the the, the proper processes. Uh, but also, you know, we were in, uh, in Egypt recently, so there was a gathering of uh, 33 indigenous elders and uh, activists from across the globe, from different traditions. And what we ended up with was you know, the idea that, uh, you know, that we're so far gone in many ways, uh, you know, in, in terms of what's happening on the planet, in terms of uh, the hold that these multinational companies have on governments, that it's important for us, you know, like uh, the previous speaker was speaking about a new table, you know, the elders were saying we need a new canoe and we need to launch a new canoe. Uh, you know, with different values and, you know, living in harmony with each other and, and, and the earth. Because as the other canoe starts to sink and, and fall apart, it's really important that we already plant the seeds uh, for something new. Thank you. That was a beautiful note to end on there, what we have to do to plant the seeds. Um, I also really appreciate that you talked about David and Goliath because uh, I often hear people saying like, oh, this is like David and Goliath as if it's like a complaint. And I keep saying, well, like David won. <laughs> so we can't forget that part. <laughs> um, so thank you. And thank you for winning. Um, that, that was amazing. And I'm so happy for um, the, the folks there on the wild coast. Um, okay, now, so for this last round of questions, it's, it's actually one question, um, and I'm going to put the question out last. Um, what I'm going to do first is um, kind of plug a little idea into each of your heads about what I was thinking you might want to answer. I might be wrong, and you, you can scrap it if you want, but I had, I had thoughts for each person, so I'm just going to throw this out, so I need my panelists to, to listen. 
Um, Delilah, I was thinking for you, um, if you'll keep this in mind when I ask the question, um, the United Nations has the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which is, we, as we know, is not recognized, as well as tribal sovereignty and leadership in many of our communities, um, and also the situation that we face with the two-party system here in the United States. Okay, so pause. We're going to move over to Robert, and I'm going to give him my thoughts before the question. It's a little backwards, but that's kind of the way I operate sometimes. Okay, Robert, I want you to keep in mind um, youth, um, a just transition and inclusivity, okay? And also returning citizens. Um, and Poovin Moodley, let's see, down here I have for you, um, you're really like tapping into um, my like legal geek over here. Um, I have a master's in law and I don't always get to practice, so I'm super excited to talk about some of this stuff. Um, the legal principle of ecocide as the fifth crime of the International Criminal Court, um, the rights of nature, and the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Please keep that in mind while I ask my question. Okay, now, um, the question is finally, in the face of the oppression of the fossil fuel industry and other forms of environmental injustice, how can we all use community resilience to shift the paradigm to protect our climate and liberate ourselves? Shall I repeat it? Yeah, I'll just repeat it one more time. Finally, in the face of the oppression of the fossil fuel industry and other forms of environmental injustice, how can we all use community resilience to shift the paradigm to protect our climate and liberate ourselves? And I'm gonna go on mute and I would love for the three of you to talk about it. And you can you know, talk about the things I mentioned or you can just, just go on on your own. You know, I, I, you know, I, you, you told me to think about youth that that first part piece of it, and and I would just want to say that you know it, it, I really do firmly believe it starts with education, starts with the youth, it starts you know because I, you know um, developing this curriculum with these uh, instructors uh, for uh, the solar cup program, and it's all about planting those seeds because I believe we're we're really leaving this next generation with a big problem. And what I'm afraid that they're going to do if they don't have the tools, you know, they're going to put their head in the sand and, you know, they may turn to other forms of, of non-healthy uh, habits. And, and, but if they, if they feel like they got the tools, they're, they're going to face climate change. They're going to face these problems head on and they're going to deal with them. So um, I really do uh, firmly believe in the, the piece about education and working with the youth. Um, and, and, and I think that that's a, a very big, important part of, of all this in, in the future. I would have desperately improved if I had had some sort of um, youth guidance, you know, um, I had to move away from my community when I was very young and it was always really hard to reconnect. Um, in Texas specifically, because we only have three federally re uh, recognized net tribes, um, there's a lot of other tribes here that are, they don't have that recognition and they have, it's all separate legal battles, you know, they've got to um, show their paperwork and, and, you know, some people still want to do blood quantum and there's Apache and Comanche and all kinds of different tribes that came from this, this place. And, um, I think that it's a, that's a very important point that, you know, our children need to be educated. Um, they need to be informed. And, you know, as we know, the United States does not honor the treaties. We're, uh, at threat of losing the ICWA at this moment. And I mean, we, we still haven't even uncovered all of the, the graves and, and you know, the horrible wrongdoings. And so it is such a complex issue to, 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 these are ongoing problems and ongoing crises that we have to make amends and find some reconciliation or healing from the past and yet still continue forward with these struggles. Um, and and we cannot do it alone and we all do need to be on the same path at least in regards to the environment and our wellness one angle that i suggest for um, at least people living here is patients rights if you use your rights as a patient um, to not be harmed by pollution and to not be harmed by um, your environment i think there's a really good strategic legal, legal angle there that we could be utilizing 
Fertig. Good, Delilah. Um, yeah, just to add a couple of thoughts. I think, uh, firstly, on, on the rights of, uh, of nature, I mean, th there have been a lot of precedents uh, over the last few years uh, across many different jurisdictions uh, and some really good cases that have been won uh, from New Zealand to India to South America and so on. Mm -hmm. But the point I'd like to make around that is I, I think it's really important to see the interconnectedness between the rights of nature and human rights. Um, because, you know, what the, there's a tendency to have a kind of fortress type conversation, conservation mentality, mm -hmm. uh, which has caused, uh, you know, P indigenous communities, especially being kicked out. We've seen this across many different continents. Uh, you know, in the name of uh, conservation and, and protecting nature. Uh, but there's a case, uh, the futures case in Colombia, which was really good because what it did was show that, you know, indigenous communities living, uh, you know, in in uh, uh, in forest areas, areas are protecting those forests. Uh, and there's a symbiotic relationship and it's important to protect both the people, uh, you know, and, and, and nature at the same time. So I think, you know, making those arguments uh, in court, uh, the interlinkages, I think, um, you know, is really important. There's uh, a lot of work that's been done on ecocide, both in terms of, you know, looking at the the meaning and, and the definition of it, which, you know, is now being accepted, uh, but also a lot of advancements that, that have been made. And, uh, I think Proven is dealing with some uh, limitations with internet connection. You know, I can I can say something about the rights of nature too. And and you know, I ran for city council here in the state of Minnesota for the very fact to give the it, it you know it's already done. Uh, so you know, really important that you know we push in every angle, and I do think we should continue pushing you know on 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 the eco side uh, uh, tra trajectory. Uh, but ultimately, I, I do think, and just based on what's going on at the moment, is ultimately it's in our hands. It, it's communities and people, uh, you know, that have to win this battle. It's not going to be corporations. It's not going to be governments and so on. Uh, and and it's about us standing up and standing up together. Yeah, I think that's an important point. Like we have to win, so <laughs> we have to work together because we have to win. Um, so we just have to figure out how. I, I wanted to touch base because it really made me think when you said connecting um, the rights of nature with um, human rights law, because I was fascinated when I began my studies in law to study the Awastini tribe in Nicaragua, who changed the definition really of um, human rights law that, that really identified people as individuals and treated people as individuals under the law. And the Awa Sydney tribe taught that that doesn't work for them and that they're a collective and that they have to be treated as a collective because they they are interconnected. And, and I feel like when we tie in human nature, like the rights of nature, it ties in the fact that like, you can't protect us. We can't protect ourselves if we don't protect nature. We are literally all tied together. So um, learning from the Awa Sydney, um about redefining ourselves and redefining our definition and redefining laws because you know, there's there's people who, who criticize laws. It's just, you know, it's just this like human made up thing, but there's a double edged sword to that. Like, yes, it is. So let's let's do that. Let's recreate that and prove and keep fighting and keep winning because you are changing and you're setting precedents. And it's amazing. You know, um, Bob, you were about to say something yeah. when we had a pause and then Delilah, I see you smiling. So I want to make sure we get back to you. Yeah, just two things real quickly. You know, that's language, right? Because part of the language of those people um, is community based. So, you know, the English language is very transactional. So it's all about something that you can get from here, what I can do for you. So in their language, it's more community based and the Ojibwe language is community based. So it's all about our relatives and about our spirituality when we when we speak our language, whereas the English language is, is, is all, it's all transactional. So there's a there's the disconnect right there. Right. So the way that we use language is also the way that we think in the way that we look at the world. And so if we're continuing to use the English language in that manner, then we're gonna to continue to look at it as a piece of property and what do we get the most out of it, right? So we have to re rethink about what are the knowledge gaps and how are we not using you know, our languages, right? And so that's why those people are so community based around that, right? They think they look at it and think of it differently because they use a different language. Second thing about the rights of nature 
is, you know, um, people, you can all do something. You can vote people into office, right, that are going to change those laws. You know, I ran for city council here, and one of the things that I wanted to do was give the rights of nature to, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Mississippi River. And, and, and because we are a headwater state, because we are part of this big body piece of water, we are sending so much chemicals down the roadway to, down to, you know, the rest of the country. And so, you know, both those people in that are going to, uh, you know, be uh, climate champions. Um, now, I lost my election, and that's fine. But, um, but you know, um, the, the people have spoken, right? But, but, um, but I would strongly suggest that, you know, we vote those individuals in that um, are speaking um, in a manner that, you know, um, is going to be uh, beneficial to, to the environment, so. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all of that. I think it is important to, um, you know, use our, our voices and, and advocate for ourselves. But I think we would be remiss to underestimate the working class right now. Um, the rail workers were supposed to go on strike today and the Congress, you know, voted against them and, and are trying to shackle them to unfair yeah. working environments. And so I think that the struggle to be more inclusive and to get more people power behind it has to include poor and working class people. Um, you may not understand that you being exposed to lead or um, asbestos or chemicals uh, may be an environmental fight. You know, you may think of it only as um, a patient fight. Like you have cancer now or you're sick and, and it's, it's close into that. But the broader expansion is that, yes, it's an environmental fight, but also it's a fight for workers and for, and for individuals to be free from these, these harmful things that are causing them to be unwell. So um, yeah, it is so important, you know, to utilize your power but also to, to coalesce that power among your, your fellow class, because we really can't do much without each other. We, we cannot, you know, like it's illegal for us to protest where they're building pipelines. We can't do that. We, ha we can go to their office. We can, you know, go to the courthouses. And every year we're going to find that we're losing more and more of our rights as individuals to protest and dissent. So, um, you know, to incorporate the labor movement into environmental justice, I think is imperative. And also, I just wanted to bring up that, you know, the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex are one of the two driving forces for climate change and um, loss of rights. So, you know, the military industrial complex wastes so much of fuel, just transporting fuel. And, you know, like we've all seen, I did a you know, a panel before on the effects of military industrial complex and what that, how that changes the land and the soil and the water and the people, you know, you've got Monsanto that is, uh, you know, caused so many generations worth of um, medical illness. So I, I think it's, uh, it's hard to incorporate it all, especially when we get so focused in our work that we are doing. But I think it's really important to understand that your, your class your fellow workers, um, your fellow poor people are really the, the driving force because we're more powerful when we're collected. And, um, you know, I think that's why I was smiling earlier because I thought about all the times, you know, I've kind of like been neck and neck with somebody outside holding signs or going, you know, helping sign petitions. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of power that, that we're not realizing and we're not reclaiming for ourselves. And I think we need to to do everything we can to support each other, not just in these fights, but it, even just in our basic, you know, survival and wellness. It's it's really important that we take care of ourselves and each other because that's how it has to be. Yeah, that kind of brings us back a little bit again to the very beginning of the conference. One of the um, pre-recorded uh, videos that we had, or it was like an audio with some um, footage showed um, Justin Noble was talking about the workers and how they face radioactivity in their work. So like their struggle is our struggle. And, and whether sometimes like, you know, we get pitted between this idea of the economy, grow the economy and jobs, 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 the fossil fuel industry, the reality is they are treating the employees horribly there and it's dangerous, you know? 
Um, and they're excluding so much. Like Robert, I know in your work, I've looked you know, and learned from you about how you um, incorporate and embrace um, having returning citizens coming back from prisons and, and creating that as part of the workforce, as an integral part of the workforce. Mm -hmm. And I think this is important for all of us to remember that we have solidarity with them. They, we cannot let them, we can't let the, the powers that be pit us against one another. Um, and they love to come in and divide and conquer. And, and we have to just remember that that's not, you know. Yeah, and, and, and you know, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll address the returning citizens initiative real quick. It was a program that we put together to train inmates on how to do solar installations. So the idea here was to battle mass incarceration with climate change, fight climate change with mass incarceration. So that was the idea there. Um, we had like a grant for 150 people to get trained and they all got, they got trained um and um uh there are uh, some some of them are, are in the in the uh, solar industry right now working and um i'm very proud of them and very excited for them to see where their careers take to take themselves to um and uh by the way that got national attention i spoke with seven states i think new york was the last state that i talked to uh about this program and uh, they were going to try and implement their implement it in their state so uh that that is a really good thing um second thing there um you know, I deal with the unions, I deal with labor a lot. Um, and, you know, I, my, my advice to labor um, is, you know, uh, you know, I, I understand that the politicians like to play the race game. They like to pit us against each other. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, man, we are in the same boat. So, you know, uh, try not to fall for those tricks um, because, you know, um, I get it, you know, uh, it's the easiest way to divide us by race, um, but um, you know uh, that's not going to solve your problems. And the same problems that are affecting your family, same problems that are affecting you know the ability for you to put uh, food on the table, the same things that affect uh, affect my family. And and so um, you know we got to quit playing. We got to quit allowing um, you know these uh, you know these uh, these differences between these two these, these two parties play the race game and, and, and divide us. And, and that's where I see the big problem at. Um, and, and uh, you know, so, so th th those are the things that, that, um, that I would try and, and explain to, and, and remember, it's not the leaders of these tri of these unions that make the decision. It's their, their, it's their, it's their, uh, you know, it's their members. So getting it through to the members, right? Because most of the part, most of the time, I'm finding the union guys under the heads of the unions understand what I'm trying to say. It's their membership that doesn't get it. So um, one of the things that I'm trying to implement into the state of Minnesota is that everybody has to have at least a 20-hour, uh, you know, multi or at least a two-hour multicultural um, kind of uh, education. Two hours. I don't think that's a lot asking. Um, you know, if you're going to have, if you're going to hold a license in the state of Minnesota, you need to have a two hour multicultural class be taken. Um, now I've got pushback from that, but you know, when you look at a situation like the state of Minnesota has had with George Floyd and everything that we were just in the news for, I think, my, I think that we should be now more than ever having, if you want to hold a peace officer's license, if you want to hold a license to cut hair, then you need to take a two hour multicultural. And if you don't do that, then you can't get licensed and you can't work. So, I mean, I think it's those types of things and how you push people to be more acceptance uh, to inclusivity and to be more diversified and to have more of an inclusionary um, kind of mindset. Um, and, and that's the only way that I can think of in order to get through to these memberships and to these unions to, to start um, looking at us as a whole instead of looking at us as fractions. So that's where I see the problem at. And that's where I see the solutions happening. Thank you so much. Poovin, do you have any final words of wisdom for us? I think we have to open it up to questions in a minute. <laughs> yeah, I think the only thing to add is, you know, that the, the time we're in at the moment, um, you know, I think, uh, the reality is we're, we're passing many of the tipping points. So many things that we're not going to be able to reverse. And I think it's important to take that reality into account. The UN Secretary General at the last climate conference said we're skirtling down the highway 
climate highway to hell and our foot is firmly on the accelerator. And, th and that's the reality of where we where we at. And many of the indigenous uh, communities and different traditions we work with, uh, you know, based on many of the prophecies, um, you, you know, we've got such a small window, uh, you know, probably over the next three years uh, to, 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 to shift things. Um, and I think it's important for all of us to know that reality, because it's going to be too late if in three years from now we say, okay, now we have to stop the destruction from happening. Uh, you know, so I think, you know, people standing up now uh, is going to be critical. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you all of you. It's really been an honor to speak with you and I hope we all stay in communication. It's been, it's been really wonderful speaking with you. Thank you. I know we have some questions because I know the chat was uh, very busy. I wasn't quite able to keep up with it. That's okay. I can throw some of those questions out there. Actually, I have a question of my own, and I guess this would be for Proven primarily, but I recently learned about the oil that's being spilled into the Niger Delta every month. It's about 40 million liters of oil. Um, there's been over 1.5 million tons spilled, over 7,000 spills since they first started drilling in Nigeria. With talk of these new lines that are expected to happen, what are people doing community-wise to oppose this? I know in the Niger Delta, there's an environmentalist who's planting mangroves, for instance, Martha, I can't recall her last name. Um, so there must be some sort of community level resilience, which is kind of how we open the conference. Um, so I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, no, thank you so much for bringing that up. I mean, that's one of the, probably one of the worst environmental disasters anywhere on the planet. And, you know, if, if you actually look at the images, uh, you know, in terms of the contaminated water, the contaminated lands and so on, uh, it, it's in many ways, it, it's suffocating uh, and just the extent of, of, of the damage. Uh, the big part of it is that, you know, and, and something we've been discussing recently is that Many of the companies, including Shell and others, are not taking any responsibility or any, there isn't any liability, let's say, um, uh, you know, that uh, in, in terms of them cleaning up. And, and that's something we're looking at in terms of how do we challenge that, uh, you know, from a legal perspective. But from a community perspective, you know, the, 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 it's, a, it's incredible how, you know, despite all of the major challenges, incredible activists have, you know, through the uh, through through the you know last decade or so, really stood up you know uh, voiced uh, what they felt as as communities challenged the government challenged Shell and so on. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the damage was done, but you know people like Nemo Bassi, uh, there's so many people, uh, incredible activists that have risked their lives. You know people have been uh, you know uh, killed uh, uh, because of this. Uh, but, you know, it, it's amazing to see that people, you know, will still are willing to risk their lives and, and you know, to, to, to stand up for, for, for justice. Uh, and I do think, you know, in, in a struggle like that, what's required is global solidarity, uh, you know, where the pressure comes from communities and people across the globe, you know, and we've seen, you know, many victories come. When, when we stand together globally, not just, you know, a small focus uh, in a country, but how, how we connect that up. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, this question, I believe, is for you. Are there any specific challenges you see with electrification that we as sustainability organizers need to face? This actually comes from Linnea, who's on the PSRPA staff, and her focus is electrification. Yeah, Linnea, it's transmission. So if we can, if we can figure out the transmission situation, um, which is going to be really huge right now, um, that's exactly how we're going to move to electrification. So um, we, we, you know, we're going to have to put up a lot of 240 kV lines around the country, around Pennsylvania, around everywhere, um, and um, and and that's what's really going to uh, be able to allow us to build out the infrastructure. Uh, for the electrification process. Um, building codes, um, we need to focus in on building codes. We gotta get the builders um, on board um, in, uh, cause uh, uh, they're gonna fight this tooth and nail. Um, 
uh, I I grew up working in construction, so I I totally get it. <laughs> Cheap materials uh, allow a bigger a bigger uh, 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 you know a bigger uh, uh, bottom line for you as a builder. So uh, you know uh, we don't want building codes, but I but we're going to need building codes if we're going to move to electrification and get rid of the natural gas uh, pipelines and uh, all that. So um, th those are those are the two main things: transmission and building codes, and uh, that's what I would highly recommend you to focus on. Um, I just want to make sure, Robert, that me, you, and Linnea connect offline on that one because you've got lots more knowledge that I think we want to tap into. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I do this every day, people. I'm here all week, so. <laughs> There's another question about challenging, I guess, any of these industries and how it may have impacted you personally within your community. So Proven, obviously you've been standing up against Shell, Delight, like you have your own things that you're working on. Can each of you maybe touch on that briefly? Um, as a mother, I can tell you personally that it has been a bit of a struggle to, the problem is that we have a lot of people that are willing to sell out to industry, organizations, politicians. You know, we had the Sunrise Movement who was advocating for the Gulf Coast, and then they advocated to elect a bunch of Democrats, which don't aren't particularly effective in the state. You know, um, I, I, I think it, it, it comes at such a personal toll to continually fight and then still try to have hope and still carry that hope with you because it's precious. I have children to raise that are environmental activists themselves. And, um, you know, they were just frustrated that they couldn't vote for me, <laughs> like when I was running for office. And, um, you know, they're, just, they, they are frustrated at how quickly people are distracted from the ongoing crises that we are facing. And so I think uh, um, personally, it is just a hard line to navigate continually coming back to we need to protect our home because it is our earth is being murdered. And those people have names and addresses and we have more power than they want us to believe. And so it's just, it's, you know, I want to be a peaceful person in a very unpeaceful environment. So that's, uh, that's personally how it's a challenge. Yeah. I think just to, to add, um, you know, the, the, the threats are very real. M many activists have been killed, uh, you know, as we're opposing the oil pipeline in Uganda. Many activists have been put in jail. Uh, there's many personal threats. So, you know, we as lawyers uh, th that are standing with communities, we, we get uh, death threats all, all of the time and so on. But it's something, you know, unfortunately, we've had to deal with all, all of our lives. And uh, and, and the bottom line is, you know, we, we are fighting for what's left on the planet and, and we have to continue fighting. Uh, but it's also inspiring to see, you know, young people across the globe standing up as well. Uh, you know, that just momentum and, you know, knowing that uh, are starting to awaken to the fact that, uh, you know, this is it for us. If, if we don't stand up now, then it's game over. Uh, yeah, I would, I would just add to all that. That is all great. Um, um, and I would just say that, you know, I mean, I, I don't have kids, you know, I'm, I'm not married. Um, it's just me. Um, so I mean, but, you know, I think about, you know, uh, my grandmother, my, my cousin, you know, my cousin's the one that, uh, that drew the, uh, American Indian movement sign. So Steve Blake is his name. Uh, he was beaten up in Washington, DC when they stormed the, uh, the, the BIA building. <laughs> um, my grandmother, uh, who uh, started the St. Paul American Indian Club in 1960, um, when my brother was hired as a Minneapolis police officer, uh, they asked him, did, you, did your family ever have a bad interaction with the Minneapolis Police Department? My brother said, my grandmother was beaten up by you guys. And uh, so, you know, like, yeah, uh, we, you know, it's just not how many times you get, you get knocked down, it's how many times you get up. And, and, um, and, and so, uh, uh, you know, it, this ain't stopping me, nothing's stopping you, you, you know, you, 
whatever, I can handle myself. So I'm an ex-boxer, so <laughs> I'm a bouncer too. I, I work with George, you know what I mean? George Floyd worked there, so I, I'm a, a bouncer too. So, you know, he ain't gonna bother me, man, you know? Um, but, you know, I, I think what it really comes down to um, is just that this is bigger than us right now, this time and moment. I believe people like, you know, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, you know, uh, uh, John Trudell, uh, Leonard Pelter, all these guys, could only dream of a moment like this where social, economic, environmental justice are all, all at the intersection and it's all at the line right now. And so this is much bigger than all of us and it calls for all of us to stand up and, um, and speak our truths and, 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 speak, and speak truth to power. And, and so um, that, that's where I feel it is. And, and I, th I, would, I would let uh, time uh, judge me in, in the end. All right. That was awesome. And we are coming to a close now. We've got one more minute. And uh, I just want to say in this final minute, thank you so much. This has been such an awesome conference. And, um, you know, bringing it all together, I had all these different people from all these different places doing all these different things. And I swore it was connected. And I think we made the point that we are all connected. We're fighting a network and we have to be a network. And thank you for being together. Let's stay together. Thank you all thank so you. much. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Everybody show your faces. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Have a great weekend. Absolutely. Thanks, y'all. Love and solidarity. Take care. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you all, PSR. Thank you so much for bringing all this knowledge to us. Much love, much love. Thank you all for being here. Thanks. Good to see you all. Hi, Barbara. See if we can. You can close it down, I guess. Thank you so much, AC. My right. pleasure. This was fantastic. Yeah, it was. Will you send me a picture of the screenshot. Yeah. From our word bubble. Oh, the word bubble. Yes, I thought you were talking to Tammy. I don't know about just now. <laughs> out of all the faces, but yes, of the word bubble. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Everyone have a lovely weekend. Yes, thank Thanks. you so much. Bye, everybody. All right, bye.